Well, everybody works the way he can work. I must point out, though, too, that I've been working in the last few years between assassinations. And that doesn't make it any easier either. I mean, they're killing my friends. It's as simple as that. And I've been all the years that I've been alive. For no reasons which, you know, which, are, which have any validity. Why don't you just want to get away somewhere and sit down and write your books? Why don't you want to do that? Because I'm better than that. But you don't have to be better than that. Oh, I do. So you don't agree, then? I mean, when people say, oh, it's OK for him, he's escaped. What have I escaped? Close your eyes and imagine that the year is 1968. You're James Baldwin and you have just been commissioned to write a new screenplay adaptation of Malcolm X's autobiography. This is a source of conflict for you because your friend and comrade Malcolm X has just passed away within the last number of years. So has another friend and beloved comrade Medgar Evers. But during the writing of this script, James Baldwin was sitting down at a hotel in Hollywood, California when he received word that Martin Luther King had been assassinated as well. Roughly a year after being commissioned for this script, Baldwin fell apart. He felt that death and mortality was all around him. And what did it mean to make a script with a studio that wanted to change it constantly and reorient the confession that Baldwin felt he had to make about these slain loved ones like Malcolm X, like Martin Luther King? What does it mean to make a cinematic project about someone that has passed? And what responsibility does the artist have? And for Baldwin, this responsibility was tenfold because he knew Malcolm X and he knew how the Hollywood machine was already trying to mutilate and change this script towards something that would sanitize Malcolm X's legacy. Eventually, Baldwin reached a breaking point and he was sent to the hospital. His friends were worried. As Baldwin says in No Name in the Street, the Hollywood gig did not work out because I did not wish to be a party to a second assassination. What might Baldwin think of a biopic being made today by the likes of Billy Porter, who is a known Zionist? The answer is still back in 1968, and that's what we're going to spend this video exploring. In this edition of Putting an End to James Baldwin Nostalgia, I want to talk about how James Baldwin's reaction to the biopic that he was attempting to write a screenplay for in 1968 gives us evidence today about how Hollywood sanitizes black radical figures like James Baldwin, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Fred Hampton to make award season fodder like Rustin, Bob Marley One Love, the new Amy Winehouse biopic, and why this is so insidious and the effect that this can have on the artist and the effect that it had on James Baldwin. For those that don't know, Billy Porter, as far as 2023, announced that he is slated to co-produce, co-write, and lead act in a forthcoming biopic about James Baldwin. This has been the source of a lot of controversy for many people. Some people say that Billy Porter does not have the acting range, his support of the state of Israel, and signing subsequent letters after October 7, 2023 to support the state of Israel's response to Palestinian people. All of these are sources of conflict, and I've spoken a lot about this on my TikTok, which you should check out, and I also have another video kind of breaking down the general problems with Billy Porter's interview where he reveals himself as a Zionist and capitalist. Since I've been reading a lot more Baldwin lately, I stumbled upon No Name in the Street, which is one of Baldwin's later collections where he talks about various aspects of racial, cultural, and social identity. In this, he opens up with talking about how this endeavor to make a screenplay about Malcolm X's autobiography and to kind of set the tone, it's 1968, it's the end of the civil rights movement. Plenty of people are questioning whether or not nonviolence as far as Martin Luther King's strategy is sufficient. And this debate between nonviolent resistance and violent resistance has been in the mainstream media largely through the images and visions and ideologies of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Near the end of Malcolm X's life, he was coming to terms with the fact that there needed to be a greater diversity of tactics beyond the sort of black nationalism and sort of violent direct action tactics that he was advocating for. Malcolm X was assassinated, and this led to efforts to have a screenplay made about him. James Baldwin had a great love for Malcolm X, and in David Lemming's biography, it reads of their relationship. Because of his work on the film, Baldwin had by now closely identified with Malcolm and thought of him as a soulmate. As early as their meeting on the 1961 radio program, Program with Eric Goldman, they had joined forces in a verbal attack on the conservative George Shiler of the Pittsburgh Courier, to 
whose middle-class Negro attitudes, they had had similar reactions. Baldwin's mother and brother David, one had once worked at a party in New York with the Shuler's daughter, Philippa, had played piano. The Baldwin-Malcolm alliance that was forged in the early 60s was built on an understanding that they were clearly coming from the same place, a place from which King, a college-educated member of the Southern bourgeois, just as clearly like Shuler did not come. Baldwin and Malcolm shared a temperament and an anger that was based in self-education and the deprivation of the Northern ghettos. Baldwin felt a lot of affinity towards Malcolm X. He wrote about how he had such a respect for him that that respect was indistinguishable from love. You can see it in the style of debating that they had, how they were both very fierce on an outward level, but to many people that knew them, they were soft or could be soft. They could be charming. They could light up a room. These similarities, like when Malcolm X passed away, cast a very large shadow over James Baldwin. And you can see this shadow in the documentary, I Am Not Your Negro. You can also see it in the screenplay that he attempted to write that I Am Not Your Negro is based on. And you can also see it in the Malcolm X script that James Baldwin wrote that later was turned into a book. James Baldwin is attempting to write this screenplay that is heavily lyrical, that has a lot of thematic undertones. While he is writing this script, there are basically two general sides of the story in this history. One version of the history is what James Baldwin has written about, which is that he was working on this script, sending in scenes to his collaborator with the studio, and eventually the studio wanted to peel things back a little bit. They didn't want James Baldwin to have any significant mention of the Nation of Islam. They also didn't want James Baldwin to mention Malcolm X's pivotal trip to Mecca that shifted his perspective on black nationalism and turned him more towards a sort of internationalist approach to organizing that would involve a diversity of tactics. This, of course, angered James Baldwin because he believed that if you're going to make a film about someone like Malcolm X, especially so shortly after his death, it should be reflective of a complete complex and full reality. This eventually brought more conflict between him and the studio and eventually the studio hired Arnold Pearl to help rewrite various parts of Baldwin's script. He didn't like that this editor was turning his script into something that the lyricism and power behind what he was writing was being stripped away because Baldwin had major critiques of how Hollywood tended to use violence gratuitously on the silver screen in order to shock audiences, not to actually give audiences a deeper relationship with that violence. Months go by as James Baldwin is working on this script and eventually on April 4th, 1968, he's sitting poolside where he's staying in Hollywood. David Lemming's biography goes on to read, on April 4th, 1968, having spent most of the day being interviewed about his problems with Columbia Pictures, Baldwin was sitting by the Palm Springs swimming pool with Billy Dee Williams having a drink and listening to an Aretha Franklin record when David Moses called to say that Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot. Of course, Martin Luther King's death um, horrifies so many around the country and the world. Baldwin notably writes about going to Atlanta to attend the funeral, essentially being traumatized by the suit that he has to wear, which weeks or months before he wore to a different event with Martin Luther King Jr. The end of the civil rights era is really really when you get, kind of get to see a break in Baldwin's kind of optimism. He's been pushed out of the March on Washington in many ways. He's been berated by people in the Black Panther Party. And now another great figure who symbolizes a better chance for America has just been killed. This all drives Baldwin over the edge. He is battling with Columbia Records. He's looking at the state of the world. He is upset that he has to go to another funeral. This all pushes Baldwin to the edge and he eventually takes a large number of sleeping pills, taking an attempt on his life once again, and he is rushed to the hospital. He is committed to walking away. He walks away from Columbia Pictures with his own individual script in hand, and he ends up in Istanbul, where he tries to continue working on this script by many, many accounts throughout James Baldwin's life and his own accounts and numerous biographies and my own experience in saint paul de France. He drank a lot. It made it difficult for him to work. That is why Columbia Records brought in an outside person to help him collaborate on the script. And even when James Baldwin was away in Istanbul trying to work on this screenplay, Soul on Ice by Eldridge Cleaver was published, and James Baldwin read this and found the famous section in it where Eldridge Cleaver basically berates Baldwin for being a queer black man that has had sexual relations with men, and not only men, but white men, which is effectively one of the worst things to Cleaver, which is definitely a dog whistle of some black men podcasting type behavior. And Baldwin would later on notably write about his experience with Hollywood and how it scarred him in a piece titled The Price May Be 
too high. Baldwin writes, the question is not whether black and white artists can work together. Artists need each other, despite all these middle-brow rumors to the contrary. The question is whether or not black and white citizens can work together. Later on in the same paragraph, he writes, what they are rejecting is that the American system, which make pawns of white men and victims of black men, and which really at the bottom considers all artistic effort to be irrelevant or threatening. I love reading through James Baldwin so much because he always has these incisive lines, which really at the bottom considers all artistic effort to be irrelevant or threatening. And if you haven't watched my last video on Billy Porter, I want to point out that in Porter's interview with The Guardian, he notes many times that it is important for queer black stories to be on screen. It's important to understand what these studio executives want. It's important to understand that stories aren't black or white or yellow, that the color is green. We have to understand green. And what Porter is asserting again and again is that queer capitalism and identity politics can matter above all else as long as we have representation. No matter Matter what that representation is and if we are folding stories to fit what the elite want what studio executives want like Baldwin's life in this Malcolm X biopic shows there is this process of things being diluted there is this process of things being erased there are so many political ties and connections in Hollywood that when a true radical artist comes to the table and tries to tell an honest story they will get pushback so to argue otherwise that you need to change history and the way that we talk about it in order to make something palatable, it literally goes against what James Baldwin believes in. That this Hollywood system wants to make all artistic effort either irrelevant. You make a film about James Baldwin that reduces all of his internationalism, that doesn't talk about his pro-Palestine stances, and that talks about how he was maybe involved in the civil rights movement. That's one version of James Baldwin that is totally irrelevant to what the current political condition needs. The threatening version of James Baldwin is one that told white people what it was like. Which version? challenges the status quo and which version does Hollywood want. And there are so many emotional discrepancies in how Baldwin was considering telling this story. And one of the biggest ones that is written about in an academic article, in an article is that's titled Lost and Found, James Baldwin's script and Mike Lee's Malcolm X. In this piece, the writer Dr. Miller talks extensively about the different considerations that went into James Baldwin's version of the Malcolm X script and Spike Lee's version of the Malcolm X script, which was eventually made in 1992, starring Denzel Washington. Dr. Miller writes, this change in emphasis marks one of the many distinctions between the film and Baldwin's script, but it indicates succinctly how the perspectives of the two men diverged. Even though Spike Lee reads the autobiography through the lens of Baldwin's script, he loses something crucial in the process. The subtlety of Baldwin's tender rendition of Malcolm X's life is eclipsed by Spike Lee's polemical excesses. Hollywood is no place for confessions, yet given the power of film to shape the perceptions of African-American identity, especially in the 1990s when Lee, as well as other black filmmakers such as John Singleton and Ernest R. Dickerson reached a new level of prominence by depicting the black experience against a backdrop of street violence. Baldwin's confession needs to be heard. And Baldwin had other considerations. And what I think is fascinating when we dig into these backgrounds and histories is that we get to see all of the real and tangible creative and political considerations that Baldwin was taking into account when he was considering writing this biopic about Malcolm X. He was considering the white gaze and elite influence of Columbia Records. He was considering how to portray the fullness of this man's life and how to get across both his rage and ability to debate and be antagonistic, but also his love and vulnerability and the way that Malcolm X knew how to connect with people. All of the unsaid secrets and whispers about the nation of Islam and Malcolm X and how Malcolm X was being surveyed by the state and both the Nation of Islam in the weeks and months leading up to his death. What this movie would mean in the long run, how he wanted it to be a reference point, what he wanted it to say, how he wanted it to be a challenge to audiences, because if they could be challenged by Malcolm X and still believe that a better America was possible, which is a hope that is now dashed by all of these leaders being killed, what art and ideas and depictions of these histories do we have to offer that are going to give an honest depiction of this reality before it is swept away by the next tragedy, the next president, or the next oncoming massacre. And I can say I am interested in what some of the material differences between these scripts and projects are. I watched the Malcolm X move film in 2020 for the first time and about a year and a half ago I got James Baldwin's book version of the screenplay that he wrote about Malcolm X. I think it's titled One Day I Was Lost. Watching the Spike Lee 
biopic. I didn't love the first act. I really liked the second act. I thought the third act was fucking brutal. And I do agree with this academic paper's assertions about how Spike Lee was going for something different. He opens the film with images of Rodney King being beaten. The film comes out in 1992. There's obviously the context of the 90s to bring us into more contemporary black audiences being interested. And by 1987, Baldwin had passed away. And so I do think it's interesting that they were trying to do different things, but I agree with Baldwin's assertion that sometimes violence is used gratuitously, but I can say watching the Malcolm X film, the violence did feel gratuitous, especially during his assassination scene, but it felt honest. I do wonder sometimes with Baldwin's poeticism, which he's been criticized for throughout, especially his later works, you kind of have to question like, yes, Baldwin's script probably would have been better, but would the poeticism have kind of detracted from certain political assertions that could have been made? I mean, one big thing about Baldwin is that he was really against like being a stringent ideologist or really being tied to a certain political party or organization. Um, one of the big reasons he argued a lot with one of his first best friends in New York, Eugene Worth, was that Eugene was a staunch socialist. Eugene had a kind of a gender, an idea about how to push for liberation. Baldwin kind of thought about ideologies in similar ways that he thought about racial and cultural identity. I mean, yes, identity is real, but it boxes in. Conflict is interesting because in the later years of the civil rights movement, when the youth are turning away from nonviolence and they want more ideological approaches and they want more tactical approaches, you can kind of see why it makes sense that Baldwin would kind of struggle to stay relevant, why younger people would kind of be like, this old man is trying to be on this nonviolent shit and we're trying to go to the, the CVS down the road, you know what I mean? I wonder how much of Malcolm X's politicality would have really come through in a way that maybe a more hardline political activist who would write this script would depict Malcolm X as. And, and this is also with a grain of salt because I've read maybe like one third of, of James Baldwin's script. What an artist brings to a project, especially when depicting a radical person's life, is very, very vital. I think if you're going to write a biopic or a screenplay of a radical or revolutionary's life, you should understand how to depict their politics in a way that is symbolic of what they actually believed in. And we're looking at Billy Porter trying to write a screenplay about James Baldwin and saying, I don't care what he thought about the Middle East. I don't care about all that Palestine stuff, all that terrorist stuff. I care about what he thought about the civil rights. <laughs> oh, it's so bad. It's so bad. It's so bad. And you can see in I'm Not Your Negro and definitely in The Devil Finds Work that he writes extensively about what film and cinema and media means in terms of our cultural and historical imagination. And I would argue that today, if a queer capitalist like Billy Porter wants to write about James Baldwin in a way that is palatable to the white elite and gatekeepers that are at the top of these studios, he is also doing the work of white supremacy because you're erasing history in a way that serves what white people want people to think about history. They want, they, they want James Baldwin to just be to the mountain. And I'm like, that he was not just, ugh, it's just, it's, I think this is what um, a lot of people don't really understand about art spaces and being an artist and being politicized is that when you feel deeply and put it into your art, trauma is also felt deeply and can be put into art and sometimes can be difficult to put into art. I remember a few years ago doing an artist residency and fleeing two weeks in after the administration tried to treat this artist like shit and I was in Trump country, Florida. It's a special kind of pain and suffering that I don't think people understand. And knowing James Baldwin as someone who was so insensitive, so incisive, I can only imagine how traumatizing this was alongside it being about people that he knew dying at the hands of the state, dying at the hands of violence while also actively trying to make the world better. I think Hollywood needs to learn how to treat people better. We can look at what's happening now with Quiet on the Set premiering and the treatment of child stars and how once you reach a certain level of fame or the elite think that a story can serve them in some profit-driven way, it shuts us off from having a more complex understanding of reality, a more complex understanding of our own suffering. How the evils of historical revisionism pushed Baldwin over the edge. What is our responsibility as artists from a certain culture or background in defending that culture or background's history? What do we do when we feel like we have failed? What is our responsibility, whether individually or collectively? He tried his best, and there were so many ways that I think 
all sorts of systems failed him and I've written about it extensively and I want to continue to dig into it more. These systemic failures are kind of erased when we mythologize people and say like they were so great and they fought so much and they did so many amazing things. How could they have been helped more? Support me on Patreon where you'll get early access to these videos. Read some Baldwin. Maybe check out one of his documentaries. Maybe one of them on YouTube. Read his book. Read my book. See you later.